like to tell you, like to tell you a bit about um, the future of transport, um, sustainability, um, affordability and effectiveness. And I will be very much focused on things we're doing in, in the UK and the developed countries. But I'd like us all to have on our consciences, consciences that when we're thinking about transport in 2050, actually we need to be thinking about transport for these guys as well. Because access to personal mobility drives economic growth. And we're lucky enough to have a lot of economic growth, even if it's pretty slow at the moment. Um, there are lots of places in the world where they desperately need better access to transport than they have at the moment. And just occasionally I will, I will mention them in the story. So transport has not yet had enough attention in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, if we look at um, the clean development mechanism, for example, there are almost no transport-related projects under the CDM in developing countries. And yet, transport is absolutely critical to those countries, and if we're not careful, they will be emitting an enormous amount of CO2 from transport in the next 10 to 20 years. Transport is hugely important because globally it's the third largest contributor to CO2 emissions, but in developed countries, as you'd expect, it's much larger than that. It's about a quarter for us in the UK, and road transport alone in the US makes up 33% of their CO2 emissions. So it's huge, and we're going to have to deal with it. In the UK, domestic transport is 20% of our emissions. We've, we're the first country in the world to make a, a, a legal commitment that we will reduce our emissions by 80% by, uh, by 2050. That means pretty much we have to get all our emissions down to about the level that domestic transport is today. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. It's actually almost an unimaginably huge challenge, and I'll come back to that, because I think there are simpler ways of thinking of it. If you're having to start with a big challenge, you start with the big bits where you can have most impact. This is domestic transport in the UK. Uh, this is passenger cars, and this is vans. So light-duty vehicles makes up 70%. The other large chunk is almost 20% in heavy goods vehicles. Yes, we think buses emit a lot, but they're only 3% of total CO2 emissions. Railways are tiny. Domestic aviation is currently pretty small, and domestic shipping is pretty small as well. So we can get excited about these because they pollute cities, but actually the first thing we have to do is this, and the second thing we have to address really strongly is, uh, is the heavy goods vehicle market. So I shall unashamedly focus on cars. The, the size of the challenge on emissions for us for an 80% reduction is that what, our, what your car emits today is the, uh, the whole of the emissions per head globally um, that we will be able to emit by 2050. That's it what your car probably emits today. That's a pretty standard average size uh, family car driven something like um, 15,000 kilometres a year emits typically about two and a half tonnes of CO2. If we share in 2050 the allowed emissions across a population of 9 billion, we get over just over two tonnes each. So it's, uh, that, that to me tells us the size of the challenge. And we already know that there are some sectors that can't meet an 80% reduction by 2050, unless we drastically <laughs> reduce access to them. So unless we drastically cut access to aviation, it will not uh, meet an 80% or even a 50% global reduction target. <coughs> Farming, unless there's some really interesting new science, and let's hope there will be, um, that isn't going to meet an 80% reduction target. There are a number of others in that list. So the areas that can are going to have to do better than 80%. And two of the areas, I think, that are very likely could do better than 80% are land transport and power generation. That doesn't mean it isn't going to be a challenge. We, even in countries like the UK, we continue to drive further every year. We continue, our car ownership continues to increase. So here we are. This is distance travelled in the UK from 
I can't remember, 1950, I think it is, to 2007. It's a wonderful linear increase. What I think is really interesting, actually, is you can see the oil shock in the early 1970s. You can see the recession that followed it. You can see increasing oil prices. You can see increasing oil prices. I think you can probably predict the start of the recession rather nicely from this, actually. Anyway, but apart from those, it's been increasing linearly and doesn't actually show very much sign of reducing. Car ownership. Car ownership in Europe is predicted to continue to rise at quite a significant rate. But car ownership in developing countries is going to rise at a huge rate. At the moment, we have 6.5 billion people and roughly a billion cars, just under a billion. Just under a billion cars. By 2050, we're predicted to have 9 billion people globally. If we all had as many cars as the Americans have, there would be 6 billion cars because they have more than 6 cars per 10 people. I don't think we all need that many cars, but I think it's not unlikely that we could have 3 billion cars by 2050. And transport today already uses half of global oil production. So there's a very simple equation there that doesn't quite, uh, that doesn't quite balance. So there are going to be a lot more vehicles, even in a better designed world, I think we have to recognise. My report for the UK government was about what can we do in the short term, the medium term and the long term about this. So I'll just touch, first of all, on the short term. Uh, and then really moving back to developed countries, in the short term, there is an enormous amount we can do, actually at relatively low cost, and given the state of the economy, that's a good thing, at relatively low cost from changing our behaviour, not making our lives miserable, but really quite small changes in our behaviour, from uh, providing better information to consumers uh, and indeed... <coughs> from the improvements we know we can already achieve from internal combustion engine vehicles. And I will try and persuade you that I think our policies in the UK are actually beginning to have an impact. The recession has helped. Nobody would say it hasn't. But the, uh, this April, the, uh, the UK government introduced uh, emissions-related vehicle excise duty on second-hand cars. That, I think, is really important because 50% of new cars in the UK um, are bought, um, are, are lease cars. So they're not bought by individuals, they're bought by leasing companies. And their business model depends on the second-hand value of those cars. So it's hugely important that we have this signal that it's not just the initial cost of your car, it's its second-hand value that's going to depend on its emissions. Because we know there is only one direction that uh, legislation is going on car emissions, and that's downwards. So um, we've obviously the car labelling scheme. The, the, in, in London, the extension of congestion charging to essentially also being emissions charging. Um, the uh, fact that fuel tax escalator operates in the UK. Uh, all of those sort of demand side um, measures I think are starting to be quite effective. And indeed, so are the supply side measures, the EU 2015 target, and the kind of RD&D support that the UK government has been providing to the automotive manufacturers. So I'll say a little bit about those sort of short-term issues. I want to make a point about the development of cities, because that is hugely important, and it's certainly hugely important in the developing world. Uh, and then... Uh, the things that we've been talking about actually just earlier over lunch, how important the, the early action is to encourage the technologies that are going to be important from 2030 to 2050. And one of those I am very much convinced is going to be electrification. But if we're going to have a significant level of electric vehicles on our streets by 2030, we have to start now. Because we're asking an industry that's been optimising its products for 100 years to do something radically different. It can't do that overnight. Uh, we have to start with all the right incentives, both so that we as consumers can change, but also so our car industry can change to deliver the technologies of the future. And in the, in the UK, we've now got the Office of Low Emissions Vehicles. We've got 340 ultra-low carbon vehicles being demonstrated across the UK. Uh, we've just launched uh, a, uh, an initiative called Plugged In Places, 
which is about starting to provide the infrastructure for uh, extensive uh, electric vehicle implementation. There's an Energy Technologies Institute study on, called Joined Cities. Uh, the Committee on Climate Change is trying to persuade the UK government to adopt a, a target of 1.7 million electric vehicles in the UK by 2020. It sounds a lot, but it would only be 5% of the UK car fleet, so it's actually a very small proportion. It won't in itself have much impact on emissions, but it is about trying to pull an industry, trying to grow a new industry. Uh, and you know, the government has introduced, operated through OLEV, this £230 million fund to pay up to 25% of the cost of a new ultra-low carbon vehicle, up to a value of £5,000, running from 2011 to, to 2014. Uh, we don't think that's enough money, but it's a good start, and certainly in the current economic climate, I think it's unlikely to be increased. Uh, and we've also been running in the UK an electric van procurement scheme. But let's say a little bit about behaviour change. And uh, I thought it was rather sad, really, that the new Massachusetts senator um, uh, described himself as an American, if you like, by saying, I'm Scott Brown, I drive a truck. We need him to say, I'm Scott Brown, I drive an electric car, but we've obviously got a little way to go. However, smart driver choices in the short term is just a real opportunity, and we've got to get the message out there. If you, if you need a people carrier... You can have a people carrier with emissions of less than 130 grams per kilometre. If we could get people to understand that whatever class of vehicle they're buying, buying the best in class gives a really, really big, has a really big impact on emissions, uh, we could change new vehicle emissions tomorrow without actually any additional investment by the automotive companies. Eco-driving has been shown to be very effective, particularly, for example, for van drivers, where you can reward people, where their, their companies can reward them for using less fuel, where you've got ways of, of keeping up the good behaviour. Probably not so good for us, because we might be very good for a few weeks after the training in our own cars, but then we get back to our bad habits. But if somebody's incentivising us, we, we, there's plenty of evidence now you can continue to show um, improved uh, fuel consumption. Speed limits, hardly something that they're going to be campaigning for the election on in the UK, which is a shame, because actually enforcing speed limits, we know, has a very significant impact on, uh, on emissions. Uh, walking to the supermarket or to school, um, using the train or the bus more often. There is, there is really something like a 50% opportunity up there, um, at near zero cost, saving us all money, and really not making our lives miserable, really actually not affecting the quality of our lives or our freedom very much. But it is a hugely difficult policy area for governments. It's mostly things that people feel are a bit nanny statish and are a bit about infringing their personal uh, liberty. And people also feel are uh, a, bit, um, a bit about making life less fun for them. Uh, and we have to do a much better job of, uh, of getting those messages across. And just really to emphasise that point of choosing the best in class, this is the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders data, an organisation I have locked horns many times with, so we haven't always been best friends in the UK. But this is their chart <coughs> to show for all of the different segments we use in the UK for the car industry, from Mini through to MPV, the range of, uh, of vehicle emissions, and in every sector, sorry, the ones that go right down to zero are where there's now an electric sports car and, and obviously an electric, uh, the, the electric smart car, so they're slightly kind of unusual. But the dark green bars show that uh, in every sector, apart from the luxury car sector, um, there is a car at already at less than the EU 2015 target for new cars of 130 grams per kilometre. So you can have any kind of car apart from a luxury one uh, at a very low uh, emissions level today. And indeed, here is your, here is your shopping list. And uh, they, uh, they range at the average, the bar, you can see the black bar across, is the average car that's purchased. And these range at between more than 40% better than the average car, but certainly all of them over 25% better 
than the average um, in, the, uh, in the segment. So you can already make a big difference. Just let me say a bit about those vehicle technologies, because there is really, compared with most of the newish cars on the road today, still a kind of 50% improvement opportunity through some of the vehicle technologies we're now see, seeing coming into the fleet. Oops, sorry. Uh, there are, for example, low rolling resistance tyres, 3 to 4% improvement in fuel consumption and CO2 emissions. There are lots of powertrain improvements, some of them quite expensive, but actually there are new lubricants which can have an impact of 2 to 3%, new, some of the new lubricant technologies coming through. Aerodynamic drag, the, uh, the Polo Blue Motion has very little new technology in it, but lots of attention to the underbody aerodynamics. And that's something we've really not spent much attention to in the past. There are huge opportunities still on the car in reducing aerodynamic drag. Uh, lots of new materials, aluminium, composites coming in, uh, in uh, more extensively, reducing vehicle inertia. Um, so there is still plenty to go for in existing vehicles. And in the short term, we will continue, I think, to see uh, car... Um, we will continue to see... Um, emissions levels coming down well below 130 for con conventional internal combustion engine vehicles. When I was doing the King Review in 2007 and 2008, the, uh, the bluey-green line was where car emissions had been coming down to, and the, the pale bluey-green line was where we said, if things continue in sort of business as usual, this is where emissions will come. This was at the time the proposed EU target for 2012 of 130 grams per kilometre, and it looked like we were going to have to move pretty fast to get anywhere near that. And the pale, pale pinky line was the voluntary industry target from 1999, which clearly had been missed by miles. Well, quite a lot has happened since then, even though it's only two years. The first one depressed me rather a lot. It was the um, agreement of the EU target but coming in at 2015 rather than, uh, than 2012. And that was something I had tried to persuade the UK government should not be allowed to happen. But now we actually have two years more of data of new car emissions in the UK. And, uh, and actually, it's rather exciting because they are actually, those two black spots, coming down very much faster than we were expecting. Uh, and uh, we certainly look as if we'll make the agreed EU target and uh, we might even be on track, uh, although it's not a lot of data to extrapolate from, but we might even be on track to meet the proposed target. There have been really, really impressive improvements in technology that manufacturers have brought in. Almost every manufacturer now has got some. Uh, you can, there are a whole range of, of names for their different approaches, but they really are bringing them down. Um, the, the recession has been quite effective in getting people focused on uh, smaller cars, but also this concept of best-in-class. And this concept of best-in-class is one I think we really have to push very hard in the car showrooms. You may need a people carrier. You can have a low-emissions people carrier. Uh, and that's, I think, a, a very important message. And it really is. I think policy is starting to have some effect in this area, and we've got to keep it. We've got to keep the momentum going. And that just shows you that uh, uh, last year... The only two sectors which increased market share in the UK were the Mini and the Super Mini. So people are moving to smaller cars, and uh, we've got to continue to make that the good thing to do. Cities. A really interesting area. Not really my field of expertise, but it, there's some very exciting stuff going on in this area. Calgary, 90% of trips are made by car. Hong Kong, about 17% of trips are made by car. How do we make sure cities in the future are more like Hong Kong, at least from a transport point of view? Cities are getting hugely important. Already, more than half of us in the world live in cities, and that is going to increase. Urbanisation is increasing very fast. Particularly in Asia, the big red blobs we're seeing the development of megacities, cities with more than 10 million inhabitants. Megacities 
Dense cities are important because they can sustain really outstanding levels of public transport. So actually you need less cars in really dense urban areas. Uh, the people who live in these cities, particularly these new Asian megacities, they're the people who are driving the economies of those countries. So they're very important places, and they have started to capture car company thinking, and that's hugely important. Car companies are now really starting to think, how do they serve the needs of these people? This is a, a plot of GDP per head against the proportion of, uh, of trips made by car. And the red line at the top is the kind of cities we don't want, and I'm afraid that's um, the North American pattern, typically. The cities in the middle are also cities we don't really want, and that's most of Europe. And the cities at the bottom are uh, 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 the kind of cities we probably do want to learn a lot from. And we have Amsterdam and Tokyo. And way below that, we have Hong Kong. So if you take three cities at about the same um, GDP per head, and the ones there I've highlighted are Hong Kong, London and Calgary, and apologies, Dublin doesn't appear on this plot, so I couldn't highlight, uh, highlight you. But Hong Kong, as I say, less than 17% of trips are by car. London, it's over 40. And Calgary, it's somewhere around 90. So we really have to get city design right, and we really have to make sure that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the new, new cities that are being developed and uh, are, are uh, down at the bottom of this, uh, of this graph. And there's a lesson for us in developed countries there, which is about how we let cities grow. If cities grow by dispersal, or if cities grow by compaction, you get very different effects. And uh, the modelling we've been doing on the Committee on Climate Change suggests that if, for a city model that happens to look like that blob in the middle, if you grow it, allow it to grow by dispersal, as we've typically done in the UK, uh, but also as Calgary, North American cities typically do, um, you, you obviously you drive uh, an awful lot of extra transport. None of those little satellites is going to be big enough to have sustainable public transport. So you drive lots and lots more car ownership and car use. If you can compact a city, you can, be, you can control additional car use uh, much, much more successfully. And we've got to have a lot more thinking of that sort. Um, because we actually need to look at the whole system, obviously, and not just uh, the vehicles that people are driving. So that's the sort of short and the medium term. If we're going to get more than 90% uh, reduction in CO2 from transport, we've got to have some radical technology changes in our vehicles. Um, and any of you who are engineers will know that every engineering company is full of Dilbert cartoons. Dilbert is actually an IT engineer, but uh, people who work in GE and Ford and um, Rolls-Royce all know that his working environment is not unlike those of engineers in other sorts of companies. The 90% reduction per kilometre options are probably biofuels, but almost certainly electricity and hydrogen. I say probably biofuels because there's still, there was a lot of controversy about biofuels when we were doing the King Review, there's still a lot of controversy about biofuels. The EU have just recognised, or the Commission have just recognised that the EU target of 10% biofuels is probably driving deforestation and that uh, we therefore really shouldn't push that too hard. <laughs> that very first chart I showed you of global emissions, electricity generation, power is the major contributor, transport is the third largest contributor, Land use change is the second largest contributor to global CO2 emissions. It's a really sensitive area. So biofuels, I hope we'll develop algal biofuels, and I suspect they'll be part of the mix in 2050. But we, we have to be careful how we drive that at the moment. Hydrogen, I'm sure, will be part of the long-term solution. Electricity is something we can do right now, and we have to start developing these technologies for the future right now if they're going to be mature by 2050. So the Committee on Climate Change recommended some rather ambitious targets for the government uh, in the UK that we should have 1.7 million electric cars on the road by 2020. We did a lot of analysis on battery costs and we believe there's something like 70% to come out of the battery costs. 
So we really do think that we can make electric vehicles um, cost effective uh, and we have, to, uh, we have to encourage early adoption by essentially subsidising the prices of this expensive technology. Why do we think that, that, electric, that electric vehicles could be so important? Fundamental to reaching our 80% targets in the UK is decarbonising power generation. Unless we do that, we're going to miss them. And the kind of trajectory we have to get down is that we're, we're currently... In fact, when we drew this plot, uh, which was in 2009, uh, we were, 2008 emissions were up at almost 550 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Uh, actually, because of the coal price and because some of our nuclear came back on after refurbishment, the 2009 emissions are already magically down to uh, just under 500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, but actually not due to any new developments <coughs> at all, simply a change in, in fuel mix on the grid. Uh, so we are actually slightly, looking slightly better than that. But anyway, the, the difficult bit is that if we're going to meet our, our targets, by 2020 we have to be down to around 300 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, and by 2030 we have to be down at around 90 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So we will have a remarkably decarbonised grid compared with what we have at the moment, and we need to be then using that low-carbon electricity for things like home heating and for things like mobility. So here are our UK 1, 2 and 3 are our uh, carbon intensity of grid electricity if we're going to meet our 80% target in the UK. And uh, up the other axis are the effective vehicle emissions. So this is a, a typical petrol car, a sort of medium-sized family car. This is a, a, a hybrid, so this is the old Prius, and in fact the new Prius is down a bit, bit less than 100 grams uh, per kilometre. An electric car of equivalent size on uh, today's generating mix, or last year's generating mix, would be towards the bottom end of the Prius band, so it would be like a pretty good hybrid vehicle. But by 2030, it would be well below anything we can achieve with conventional technology. Uh, sorry, by 2020. And by 2030, uh, it would be down at less than uh, about 15 grams of CO2 per kilometre. So it would be already a really low emissions vehicle. So that's a, a real opportunity in terms of decarbonising a big sector of road transport. And although we know that electric vehicles have limited range and are likely to continue for the next 20 years or so to have limited range, 99% uh, of the trips we make in the UK, and this is an analysis for the department, from the Department for Transport of the trips we make, 99% of those trips would be within the range of a typical electric vehicle, accounting for 88% of the CO2 emissions. So at the moment, we're all buying cars for 3% or 2% or whatever of what we really actually need them for. There are quite a few issues um, along this path. How do we make some of these things happen? And I'd just like to share some of the things that I think at the moment, because we're on a very interesting journey, at the moment some of the things I think are particularly important. Uh, one of them is I think there are a lot of initiatives going on around Europe and globally, and we need to be sh urgently sharing the outcomes of those big experiments, basically. Uh, one of the key ones is, if we're going to have electric vehicles, how much is this charging infrastructure going to cost? And we, we again, we have to be economical at a time of recession. We don't want stranded assets. So what do we really need? Uh, and I think the early um, indications were that we needed rather a lot. So this was, again, a, a last year... Um, in our Committee on Climate Change report, we looked at the costs of charging infrastructure and we said we're recommending these 1.7 EVs as a target for 2020 in the UK. What kind of money is that going to cost us in infrastructure? And the problem was the band was quite large. There was an order of magnitude difference depending on the assumptions we made about the kind of infrastructure we needed. So we moved from a kind of quite doable number to a possibly rather off-putting number. And the early information was everybody was getting very excited about range anxiety. Um, this was some data from the, Toyo the, the um, Tokyo Electric Company uh, for, I think, 10 electric vans they had 
uh, which went round their plants, and uh, that showed that people suffered terrible range anxiety, and nobody would, would, would return the vans with batteries discharged more than 50%, because they were so insecure about getting stuck somewhere. But when they added one fast charger to the yard, then people's confidence immediately improved, and they started bringing back the vans with typically discharged 80%. They didn't actually use the fast charger, but it gave them the confidence to uh, use the range on the vans. And a lot of our early thoughts about how much infrastructure you might need are based on this, this feeling that range anxiety is going to be a dominant part of electric vehicle user behaviour. But actually, BMW have just finished a pilot uh, of the electric mini in Berlin, where people actually had these cars as their own cars and used them as they would use their own cars, not as a works vehicle. Um, and what they discovered was that mini electric mini drivers actually were pretty much like average German drivers. They drove actually slightly further, about 38 kilometres a day. The 200 kilometre range uh, for 90% of them was entirely sufficient for their everyday needs. They only charged their vehicles once, on average, once every three days. We all thought they'd be plugging them in every time they had an opportunity. But once they got used to them, they really couldn't be bothered. Um, so, um, and I think the, the nice one at the bottom is that um, more than a third of them actually said driving the electric vehicle was more fun than their normal car, and uh, they really appreciated not feeling guilty about it. So... We need to share urgently the information that's coming out of the early trials. And I think it's an interesting challenge for Ireland because you're thinking about putting in electric vehicle infrastructure. It's not cheap. You need to know how much investment to make or you need some guidance on how much investment to make. There are a number of trials going on and one of the things the International Energy Agency is talking about is how do we provide a giant database of all the emerging findings so that people can, uh, can start to make more informed decisions. Uh, one of the frustrations I have talking a lot about this in the UK is that there are still a lot of myths around which appear regularly in the papers and from the mouths of, of politicians and pundits of various kinds. One of them is our electricity system won't be able to cope. Well, um, this is some very simple arithmetic and I'm not going to take you through it, but what it says is the, the UK car park is 30 million vehicles. Uh, if they were all electric, highly improbable, if they were all electric and they were fully charged every three days, that would be 15% of our current, our current generating capacity. So it's not huge. And we couldn't have 30 million electric vehicles before 2050, even at going at quite a rate. So we've got plenty of time to put it in and the 1.7 million electric vehicles by 2020, which is a pretty tough target, would be 1% of our generating capacity, 1.5% of our actual usage. And if we charged them during the winter nighttime dip, we could accommodate 15 million electric vehicles with no additional generating capacity. So this, the very simple sums say we can do an awful lot of this with a smart grid without it being a problem. And in fact, this would make our electricity system significantly more efficient. When I go around talking to manufacturers, I, am, um, I suppose I, I, I often lock horns with them because I don't think they're doing things fast enough, but I have some huge areas of sympathy with them, which is that we, our legislators, do an awful lot to make their lives difficult. We are trying to persuade an industry to change and we want it to change fast. Actually, we need to help. And uh, a consistent approach to, how, for example, how we treat electric vehicle emissions across, uh, across Europe is absolutely essential. So in the UK and France, we're classing electric vehicles as zero emissions. In Germany, the government is thinking of classifying them or of, of, of um, taxing them as the average grid equivalent emissions. I don't know what they're doing elsewhere. I haven't done a comprehensive survey. But if you look at 
what that would mean for the same car in different places. Here's a medium-sized family car. It would emit 6 grams of CO2 per kilometre in Sweden and 120 grams of CO2 per kilometre in Greece. So in Sweden, you'd probably buy it, and in Greece, you probably wouldn't. So we have got to make sure that there are large um, and consistent op market opportunities for our manufacturers if we really are going to get them to make the investments we need them to make. So we do need to make sure that our governments recognise that we need at least European level agreement, if not global level agreement, on how we are going to treat these new technologies. Otherwise, they won't arrive. So really, just a few conclusions. These are very exciting times. Things are moving very fast. There's lots happening. Um, that's, that's, I think, in many ways, very good. Uh, Emissions-based transport policy is starting to have an effect both on the supply and the demand, and we need more of it. But we need it simple, we need it consistent, and we need the information to be very clear and, uh, and easily understandable. We absolutely have to get international collaboration in place because industry needs global markets to deliver into to justify the investments it needs to make. The demonstration activity, the demonstration and the deployment activity needs to be continued urgently. And we've got to start involving developing countries in this. They are actually where the huge new vehicle markets are going to be. And solving our problems is great, but solving CO2 problems means they've got to be part of this as well. So we've got to in involve them in, in this particular party. We've got to share emerging findings quickly. Um, and the absolute requirement is that we have to be able to deliver for ourselves and for the, uh, the developing countries decarbonisation and economic growth. We've absolutely got to decouple um, carbon growth and economic growth. And this is one area in which I really think we can do that. So just very quickly, I'd like to say thank you to an awful lot of people who I've had very useful discussions and collaborations with. Um, the King Review is on the Treasury website if anybody wants it. The Committee on Climate Change reports are on the Committee on Climate Change website. And that's our little smart electric car which we use as the, the university car at Aston. Uh, and I would subscribe to the electric mini user's view that actually it's enormous fun. So thank you very much. Thank you.